We now cross live to Abuja, where Imo State Governor Hope Uzodima is delivering the Michael Lokwara Leadership Lecture. Tune in. Our leader and great philanthropist, Prince Ato Eze, Eze Nuko, Chief Uzodima Obara, the chairman of Dr. Michael Obara Foundation, distinguished senators here present, using my own point of to enter the National Assembly complex to acknowledge the presence of other senators and members of the House of Representatives. The Deputy Chairman South Party in Black and White Africa the All Progressive Congress, the Vice Chairman of the Southeast Chapter, members and leaders of our great party, the All Progressive Congress, Honorable Minister of Science and Technology and Innovation, Chief Uche Naji, and through him, other ministers, both serving and non-serving in our midst. Your Royal Highness, as a clear to Silomaya, the Chairman, Imo Council of Elders, and the Secretary to the Government of my state, Imo, and through him, other Secretary to Governments of all the nine states and other states in attendance here. The Right Honorable Speaker of Imo State House of Assembly, whom I'm very loyal to, Honorable Chike Olembe, and other members of Imo State House of Assembly in our midst here this afternoon, former and serving public officers here present, representatives of other governors of the Southeast, my dear brother, the Governor of Abia State, my dear brother, the governor of Enumuku State, the governor of Anambra State. I want to acknowledge the presence of the Director General of Southeast Governors Forum, distinguished Senator Uche Ekunife Iyom, <clears throat> heads of religious organizations, traditional leaders, women organizations that are here, members of the board of Dr. Michael Obara Foundation, Ambassador K. Emuche, the Secretary General of Ohanes and Dibo Worldwide, and other members and leaders of Ohanes in our midst. Captains of industries, distinguished invited guests, gentlemen of the press, ladies and gentlemen. I want to, before we go into this lecture, which is now, I don't know whether it's lecture number three or number four, having regards to the number of lectures we've received here this afternoon, humbly in honor of the great hero we are celebrating today, acknowledge the death of his one of his great followers that recently happened, the immediate chairman or president general of Ohanes Ndibu, chief engineer, Emmanuel Iwayang, and invite all of us to stand for a one minute silence in honor of this great son of ours. May the soul of Chief Engineer Imani Ahe Jagamba 
and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Sit down. <clears throat> I am most delighted to stand before you this afternoon, you the esteemed audience, to speak on a topic that resonates with the very essence of public service is service above self, lessons from the leadership philosophy of, the, of Dr. Michael Obara. As we gather here, we find ourselves at a crucial juncture in our nation's history. The challenges we face today, from economic hardships to social unrest, echo the trials of the past. Yet, in the inspiring legacy of leaders like Dr. Michael Opara, we find a beacon of hope and a roadmap for progress. Dr. Opara's tenure as Premier of Eastern Nigeria from 1959 to 1966 was marked by visionary leadership, unwavering integrity, and a deep commitment to the welfare of his people. His philosophy of service above self wasn't just a cashy slogan. It was a guiding principle that transformed lives and built communities. Today, I want to explore how this powerful idea of putting service before self-interest can shape our approach to governance and development. In the process, I hope to share lessons from Dr. Obara's remarkable leadership and how it impacted the Imo state, which was part of the Eastern region that he governed. But before then, let me recall and I have just returned from Lagos, where a few weeks ago, I delivered this year's public lecture by the Yoruba Tennis Club. So when I received the invitation for today's event, I almost turned it down, because I didn't want my employers, the Imo people, to think that I was devoting more time to delivering public lectures and seeking the betterment of Nigeria above their immediate interest, which is my core mandate. But I reckon that if I had decided to turn down this invitation for any reason, some of my brothers and sisters might see me as Okamanama. They would conveniently have forgotten that it was not long ago that I delivered the 52nd Convocation Lecture of our own University of Nigeria and Sukkot. So I had to be here. I also believe that the good people of Imo State fully understand and that I will never check my duties and that today is a day set aside to celebrate one of the greatest leaders of our time from the Southeast our beloved and charismatic SY leader, popularly known as M.I. Power. Let me, at this point, express my deepest appreciation to the Michael Opera Foundation and Vabati Media Group for not only finding me worthy of the award, but also for the honor of delivering this lecture. Your invitation letter stated your Excellency, we are proud of your achievements. Your vision and programs for good governance and development in Imo State are in sync with the impactful spirit and development ideas of Dr. Opara. I do not know if you were clothing me in a borrowed robes or just wanted me to play Elijah clenching to the ropes of his master Elijah to have that power transferred to him. 
However, I'm immensely very grateful to you for thinking highly of me. Yet, that will not make me forget that we are having a conversation about Dr. Michael Obara, whose shoes remain big for most of us. Sixty years since he left the political stage, we are talking of a man whose political field encapsulated in pragmatic socialism appeared so simple, yet so deep. We are talking of a fearless politician who knew no boundaries, a man who believed so much in inclusivity as a weapon of conquest, and of course a man whose fables regard us as young adults and fired our zeal as leaders. Although he operated in a different space and circumstance, his ideals remain as fresh and relevant as they were 60 years ago. And strive to follow in his footsteps. Yet, attempting a comparison will be presumptuous or even impudent. Now, it's instructive that why the event organizers asked me to speak on the topic, service above self, lessons from the leadership philosophy of Dr. Michael Obara, they also graciously permitted me to use that same opportunity to share my experience in leadership and governance. As we are aware, tons of literature have been written about this legend and his legendary services to the people of the then Eastern region, comprising the current nine states of Abia, Anambra, Eboye, Enugu, Imo, Bayesa, Rivers, Cross River, and the Aquaibon State. Some of us have been privileged to read this literature, which includes several books. One of the most fascinating of them all, in my opinion, is the one written by the veteran public relations guru, Maze Kano of Henry. The book is titled, Portraits of a Leader, the biography of Dr. Michael Obara, published in Oware in 1983. Another equally interesting one is Power and Governance, the Legacy of Dr. Michael Obara by Onyema Ugochuku, published by Dr. Iyono Kara Obara Foundation in 1997. What it means is that whatever Dr. Obara did, whether it is about his philosophy of governance or his legacies, is already in the public domain. All we are now doing is to interrogate, analyze, and seek to understand why he did what he did. By seeking such understanding, we broaden our knowledge and enhance our capacity to improve upon what he did. We can describe Dr. Obara as an enigma. We can also say that he was the elephant some blind men tried to understand is based on his perception of feeling. Above all, we can say that Obara, dead or alive, has continued to challenge and stimulate our intellect and drive our vision towards attaining excellence in whatever we do in governance and leadership generally. I was only a year old when Dr. Obara became the premier of Eastern Nigeria in 1959. Before then, he had been a cabinet minister in charge of health and agriculture. Under the parliamentary system, you cannot be a minister unless you are already a member of the parliament. This implies that Dr. Obara became involved in politics and the elections before the age of 39, when he became the premier of Eastern, the, the then Eastern region. By 1979, 
When he returned from exile, I was just 21 years old. And coincidentally, the youth leader of the defunct National Party of Nigeria. Israel had gone before us, which is why the National Party of Nigeria then worked so hard to attract him to the party. Before he died in 1984, the military did not allow us to fully put into practice his experience and lessons about the sustainability of the Second Republic. But there comes the personal qualities that define the demand of Ara. Before we examine the lessons of his selfless service to Nigeria, and Eastern Nigeria in particular, let us examine the recurring qualities that define this great leader's life and political career. Number one, education. Dr. Michael Obara was highly educated and qualified as a medical officer at a tender age before venturing into politics. Thus, he was equipped intellectually, mentally, and physically to deal with the rigorous and rigors associated with politics and leadership. Most people who jumped into politics these days do so without even an address or occupation or profession and are generally ill-equipped to confront the challenges of political leadership. When you consider politics as a ticket or occupation, your focus will be on acquiring wealth and not service. Additionally, Dr. Obara did not want to be detained by the drudgery of the civil service. Hence, he boldly resigned to set up a private practice. Are today's politicians and aspiring leaders prepared to take a calculative risk? In my opinion, a man who is not prepared Dr. Obara was loyal to his leader, Dr. Namda Azikiwe. When there was a revolt against the leadership of Azikiwe, he was among the few who stood by him because Obara believed that betrayal was and still is a mortal sin in politics. None of those who betrayed the great Zeke at that crucial moment a premier. Obara, through his loyalty, became not just the premier, but also the leader of NCNC. That is the stuff the ship is made of. Most of our politicians today are not patient enough to learn that the art of loyalty is very necessary for a successful political career. Some are driven by the inordinate quest for money and position to the extent that betraying their principles means absolutely nothing again. Number three, experience. Before he became a premier, as, well, as we all know, he was a cabinet minister. He learned the ropes from his masters. He understood those before him and served diligently in lesser capacities. Unsurprisingly, when he was entrusted with the ultimate prize of leadership, Dr. Obara excelled beyond the imagination of many. Some of us didn't serve as commissioners before because I was an effective party man, starting as a youth leader, I served as a board member. Let me pause for Mama Peace of Africa to sit down.
Debos would say that you should learn to carry others' bags before others can carry your own bag. Do we follow this doctrine of tutelage as exemplified by the life of Dr. Obara? Number four, character. In most dictionaries, character is defined as a distinguishing feature of a man's life. It is also a complex of mental or ethical traits of an individual, which can also be summed up as his moral strength. If we must tell ourselves the truth, a weak man can never be a good leader. A man deficient in morals cannot be a responsible leader because he would find it hard to differentiate between wrong and right policies. Finally, someone and with questionable character can never be entrusted with leadership. From grooming, Obara emerged as a leader because he possessed these aforementioned intrinsic qualities which I have enumerated. But the philosophical foundations of Obara's governance model has to be looked into. We need to look at the philosophical foundations that drove Obara's governance model. This will help us appreciate where he was coming from and why he achieved so much. Obara's pragmatic socialism. During the administration of Dr. Michael Obara, the Cold War was at its peak. It was a struggle between capitalism with a free market economy and communism with a sprinkle of socialism. The emerging independent nations of Africa we are torn between those, these two ideological differences. And he took his toll on the economies of various nations. As the United States of America and the then Soviet Union struggled for the global spread of their respective socio-economic systems and their ideologies, Dr. Obara abandoned them, developed his pragmatic is a pedestrian definition of and still believe that socialism should be built slowly by political and economic acts of those seeking a more a more just society. This is of course in sharp contrast with communism which seeks absolute control of not just means of production, but also means of living. So both socialism and communism reject capitalism in favor of wealth equity, public control of the means of production and the socioeconomic power of the working class. So when Dr. Michael Opera opted for pragmatic socialism, what did he have in mind? Let us first understand in this context, what pragmatism means. Since we now, now have an idea of what socialism stands for. In a layman's knowledge and understanding, pragmatism simply means being practical in a sensible way. In other words, it means dealing with issues or challenges sensibly and realistically in practical rather than theoretical considerations. If we accept that, it means that Dr. Opara in his governance model was enamored by socialism only for as far as it was applied pragmatically to achieve the results he intended. In retrospect, I believe that this model drove his industrial and agricultural revolution for the six years that he was in office as the premier of Eastern Nigeria. In describing those years, a writer posited, under Dr. Obara, 
Eastern Nigeria witnessed the phenomenal developmental strides in all facets of life, industry, agriculture, and infrastructure. His legendary sense of urgency appreciated through the establishment of the Eastern Nigeria Development Corporation. If we recall correctly, it was under the Eastern Nigeria Development Corporation that the institution in agriculture and industrialization gained traction under the Obara regime. It was not a happenstance. It was a carefully planned initiative that was clinically executed with outstanding results. It was a product of the Eastern Nigeria Development Plan of 1962 and to 1968. After a successful infrastructural development, the government discovered two important issues. One, the population of the citizens of the Eastern region was increasing and therefore there was a need to plan for their feeding. That gave rise to agriculture. Second, many people were graduating from secondary schools and universities. Actually, over 300 expected graduates were being shown out on an annual basis, and there was a need to plan for their employment in the future. That gave rise the Obara's program of industrialization. Indeed, in his speech at the official opening of Nigerian Glass House Limited in Port Harcourt in August 1963, Dr. Obara explained the reasons for industrialization, emphasizing the need to, abrace of technology, to be abreast of technology, generate employment for the youth, and boost the regional economy. In the aforementioned development plan, the agricultural revolution was to go hand in glove with the industrial revolution to increase productivity and improve the standard of living of the citizenry. What happened between 1962 and 1966 is well known to all of us. Port Harcourt became the region's industrial hub Many industries were built, including the prestigious presidential hotels, both in Asia and in Port Harcourt. We know about the farm settlements and their usefulness. We know that more than two million cocoa seedlings were planted in the Ecom area alone. We know how palm fruits were processed, new seedlings planted across the region. When you see any cocoa plantation today, be it at Ajata, Ibeko, or Abozu in Ozakoli, you know it is the imprimatur of Obara. It is the same with rubber. Rubber plantations in Akampa, Ozu, Abam, and many others, and of course, cashew plantations in Okigwe and Isukwato areas. My aim here is not to regale you with information already at your disposal, but to emphasize and planning were the root of the achievements of that era. And the spread of the projects across all parts of eastern Nigeria was a product of just mind. By the time Hobara left office due to the military coup of January 1966, the economy of the eastern region was just to be the fastest growing one in the world. Today, those who are agitating for the return of regional governments point to the fact that the Obara's era was a proof of how a government can run efficiently with minimal interference from the federal, and then it becomes successful. Scholars have continued to also refer to that era as one that should signal the renaissance of purposeful leadership when there is a political way to do so. That, of course, tells us a lot about the leadership trajectory of this great leader, Dr. M. I. Obara. While agriculture and industrialization were Obara's signature project, they were not only his core achievements. As a medical officer, 
He couldn't have her left to the health sector unattended. As an educated man, Oberon valued education and paid adequate attention to it, including a sizable investment he made in the University of Nigeria and Suka to boost the training of engineers and teachers. However, his focus on agriculture and industrialization was in line with his pragmatic socialism aimed at controlling the means of production. His scholarship award and the building of basic infrastructure, including health facilities, aligned with his socialist inclination. After all, he was a member of the Zikist movement. It could therefore be said that he successfully passed through those philosophical orientations and triumphed, thus leaving unprecedented legacies in the region. The vital question is whether another person using the same governance model as Opera would, whether the person could still come out with the same grand achievements. In other words, were those models and initiatives peculiar to Opera such that it became difficult for successive governments after him to sustain and improve upon those legacies? This is a big question that we should try to find out. Why after all this platform that was set out by Dr. Michael Opara and the achievements that followed, why successive governments didn't continue to improve on them? Many will say the currency has lost its value because Opara's annual budget did not exceed 20 million pounds. There are thousands of excuses some genuine, others spurious, why the momentum of the opera era could not be sustained. But suffice it to say that Dr. Michael Opera was in his class. Yes, when we examine the achievements of his contemporaries in other regions, we can see that they too made their modest efforts in development. However, the Eastern region was described as the fastest growing economy in the world. For him to have made that extraordinary impact globally, this son of a laborer who rose above poverty and deprivation to conquer his world was imbued with extraordinary wisdom, integrity, and resilience. Undoubtedly, he rose above his peers in all the endeavors he was associated with. Now let us try to go into lessons from his leadership philosophy. Number one, honest, selfless service. In 1995, the government of the United Kingdom set up the Northern Commission on Standards in Public Life and charged them to identify a set of standards that would guide the conduct of holders of public office. In their report, which is now widely referred to as the Nolan Report, they identified the seven principles of public life as selfless, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. It is not surprising, therefore, that selfness, selflessness is the first of these principles. Selfless service or leadership refers to prioritizing the needs of others above leaders' self-interest. Selfless service is crucial for addressing societal challenges and delivering value for citizens. Usually requires the leader to regularly engage with the citizens in decision makings, fostering transparency and accountability. This way, a government or a leader can build trust and legitimacy. Selflessness also requires physical responsibility and efficiency in using taxpayers' money to maximize value and minimize waste. In addition, selfless leadership is vital in advancing public policy objectives that benefit the larger society as a whole. Rising above partisan interests, 
while focusing on the common good of citizens, enables leaders to address inequalities and by so doing, achieve greater and far-reaching success. From the foregoing, one can argue that selflessness was pivotal to the success story of the man we are talking about today. Despite being a premier for six years, Dr. Michael Obara could not build a house for himself. The story had it that his friends hurriedly built a house for him so he could have a shelter when he returned from exile. There is no greater lesson than this as far as selfless service is concerned. This puts Michael Obara in the same league as Mahatma Gandhi in India. He was a flamboyant politician, no doubt. Class. Unlimited but restrained himself the common interest against like the leaders of today. He must have been tempted by contractors who handled road projects, housing projects, industrial projects, and many more. Yet he remained true to himself. His rendering of honest and dedicated service without hands in corruption is an enduring lesson that those of us currently in public office should emulate. Public office holders should live within their legitimate means. I stand here to tell you that no public servant who lives within his statutory income will ever be hungry in life. However, temptations, pressures from different quarters, Lack of discipline and inordinate quest for wealth are responsible for the unbridled corruption prevalent in our society today. Number two, integrity. Next to honest service is integrity. This is another prominent inclusion in the seven principles of public life. Integrity is a summation of one's character proven over time. Integrity also means the protection and the honoring of one's name. Shakespeare captured it when he declared thus, if you you have taken everything from me. Ibos call it Eziafa. It is a built over the years. Obra had that going for him. Forty years after his demise, he is still celebrated and called the epitome of visionary leadership and selfless service. Some former public officers or office holders who left just five years ago have been forgotten or remembered with hisses here and there. Number three, inclusivity. I have taken time to study the opera phenomenon. One of the greatest legacies of his leadership was inclusivity. He was an Igbo man, yet most of his developmental initiatives were concentrated in areas outside Igbo land. Port Harcourt became the garden city because of opera. From the glasshouse factory to the presidential hotel and dozens of other industrial concerns, the administration of opera made Port Harcourt the industrial city that it is today. He worked for the greatest good of the majority. Thus, it didn't matter to him where projects were cited because he believed in comparative advantage in economics. Each city received attention based on what it could offer or where it had the greatest strength. This hall today, is full of contemporary politicians. Can we do what Obara did? Our honest answer should be one of the lessons from Obara's leadership dynamics. By being fair and just, Obara taught us an enduring lesson of leadership. Number four is followership. Obara's simple and contented lifestyle earned him respect, 
earned him influence and followership. In Nigerian politics today, we have a lot of people in leadership positions, but some of them do not have followers. Leaders have to set ethical and moral standards which their followers can emulate. It is similar to raising children in a family. Children are taught more by the actions of their parents than their words. I'm not in a position to say that it was this court-like followership that saved his life during the coup. I will not also say that he was more popular than his peers because of that simple way of life. But I do know that his friends would not have, would not have gathered to build a house for him upon his return from exile if he had not learned one or two things from him. Especially, most of his friends attest to the fact that he was humble, he was honest, and that guided and brought him loyalty. And nobody sets out to build a house without first sitting to analyze the cost. The Eastern Nigerian Development Plan of 1962-1968 was the catalyst for the successes recorded by Dr. Michael Obara during his tenure. As I mentioned earlier, he took a careful look Especially, most of his friends attest to the fact that he was humble, he was honest, and that guided and brought him loyalty. Who is as thorough, dedicated, and disciplined as Opera will surely achieve the kind of results that he did for Eastern Region in the six years of his premiership. Number six is believe in continuity. One of the factors that contributed to our tenure was the fact that his future. I sincerely recommend that document. I sincerely recommend that document to our current and emerging leaders not just because of his comprehensive details, but also because of implementation precision. Forecasting what will happen in five years with the application of variables made that development plan one of the best sought after documents. I sincerely believe that any leader who is as thorough, dedicated, and disciplined as Opera will surely achieve the kind of result that he did for Eastern Region in the six years of his premiership. Number six is believe in continuity. One of the factors that contributed to Opera's successful tenure was the fact that he stooped to learn from another master, the legendary Zeke of Africa himself. As the premier, Dr. Nanda Ziki will lay the foundation. Opera built on it. Obara did not discard the developmental initiatives of the great Zeke of Africa, but he improved on them. His 1962 to 1968 development plan was built upon an earlier one implemented by Dr. Nanda Ziki as premier. Areas like education and road infrastructure were covered. Obara built upon them and even leveraged the availability for his runaway agricultural and industrialization policies. The lesson, of course, is that government is a continuum, and anyone who wishes to succeed must first understudy those who have succeeded in the position they seek to occupy. Number seven is political tolerance. It is instructive that Obama's tenure lasted that, that long without any recorded scandal. I said recorded because 
I had tests of the man who does his way during campaigns in the West, and that even when Chief Awolo refused to receive him at the government house, he would still storm the place to register his presence. That is dynamic. That is charisma, devoid of any political bitterness. Although NCNC was dominant in the East, eastern part of the country, I didn't read of the opposition being emasculated or politicians being hounded because of their political affiliation. In other words, tolerance was a virtue as far as Obara was concerned. The question is, are the present politicians doing that line? Number eight, acting with precision. But most importantly, the profound lesson from Obara was that he knew how to strike when the iron was hot. He never tarried because of indecision or procrastination. He brilliantly embraced the policies and programs that have a direct impact on the people, irrespective of ideological differences. His pragmatic socialism benefited both the government and the people. It was like a man eating his cake while still having it. If he had given heed to those theoretical considerations before implementing the Eastern Nigerian Development Plan, what we know today of the Southeast and South South would have recorded a stunted growth. But by shunning corruption and embracing developments, he wrote his name in gold. That, I believe, is the living lesson all of us should learn from his leadership. Now, taking advantage of the offer by the organizers of this lecture, to link my emo experience, there is no doubt that this inspiring story of legendary MI power has rubbed off on me in my tour of duty as the governor of Imo State. Although I, did, I didn't have the luxury of understanding directly with my predecessors, I leveraged the experience of this master and others like him. I said I was only 21 years old when I returned from exile. But the impression I had of him and that of Chief Sam Mbakwe, another charismatic leader, prepared me for where I am today. Unlike others who had leadership trust on them, it is the grace of God and my struggle that made me to become governor of Imo State. I started this journey. I started this journey in 2003, running for an election against an incumbent. After that, my people persuaded me to represent them in the Senate. That was in 2011. I served for eight years in the Senate. After that, there was another invitation, this time from Imo people, asking me to contest for the governorship election, for the collective interest of Imo people. I also responded. The election was held and I won convincingly. Listen, listen, <clears throat> but the mandate, the mandate was stolen and I had to spend seven months before I reclaimed the mandate through the courts. Thereafter, thereafter I hit the ground running Because I was already prepared to be governor, I had my blueprint for the governance of Imo State. In addition to the manifesto of my great party, the All Progressive Congress, I was not deterred by the fact that there was no formal handover of power to me, nor by the fact that the state had been run down and abandoned. But I was determined to move on, and I did. Under my prosperity agenda, encapsulated in reconstruction, rehabilitation, and recovery, I moved fast to get him working again. Starting from the civil service, which is the engine of government, to road construction and reconstruction, 
My administration was able to restore and recover the years the locusts had eaten. <laughs> today, today we can boast of having the most efficient and automated civil service east of the Niger. This is our pride. They are well motivated. The civil service is working. Salaries paid regularly and as at when do. Pensions and gratuities being given the attention it deserves. That gave me an idea of how to tackle other needs of the people. The Owere capital city was without public water when I emerged as the governor of Imo State for 15 years. I restored that and it started working. Adapam Nigerian Limited, an agricultural legacy of Dr. Michael Obara, was in ruins. I got it working again. Because the roads in the states were in terrible shape, I started working on them. As of November 2023, I had delivered on more than 100 roads, including the signature projects of the Olu Oweri Road, dualized, the Oweri Okigwe Road, and the Oweri Omaha Road. I also checked the perennial flooding in parts of Oweri City. In education, the administration is funding and running three universities, and the only state in Nigeria running three universities on their own including several nursing and midwifery schools. We have also embarked on the rehabilitation of all primary and secondary schools in the state. The Imo State University Teaching Hospital, Olo, which was hitherto bad from producing medical doctors because of the inadequacy of facilities and the withdrawal of the accreditation, is now up and running. For the past three years, it has been churning out medical doctors. We have three brand new hospitals built and equipped to world class, and as well as getting others fully rehabilitated. As usual, our students maintain their premier positions in external examinations because the schools are once more working and now well equipped with qualified teachers manning them. It might interest you to know that all the farm settlements established by Dr. Michael Opara in what is now known as Imo State have all been rehabilitated and they are in operations. Millions, millions of palm trees are being planted across the state to stimulate more interest in agriculture for sustainable development. Encouraging food security was Michael Opara's vision. Happily, it is the focal point of President Bola Ahmed Tinimbu's led administration. It is also the vision of my government. Currently, all the communities in the state are being encouraged to establish one agro-based enterprise through our One Kindred, One Business Initiative, OKOBI. This will stimulate industrial growth in the rural areas, create jobs, and stimulate the state's economy. With the excellent network of roads, spanning the 27 local government areas of the state. The movement of goods and services has become more accessible, thus relieving pressure on the urban, center, the urban centers. For our youths, we have suffered unemployment due to the global economic recession. We created a ministry for empowerment and digital economy to equip them with relevant digital and other skills for employment and self-employment. Thousands of them have been trained in various skills and provided tools and money to start up their businesses. Women also benefited from the scheme. Also, under the Skill Up Emo project, thousands of other youths have been trained in the digital economy and the requisite packages presented to them. Currently, many of them are working abroad while others have become employers of labor. The bottom line is that my government has been planning for the future of our youths. And just like the Great Opera rolled out the Eastern Development 
plan. I have initiated an EMO development plan, which will run from 2023 to 2034. Under this plan, which obviously will at leave my administration, a holistic and deliberate roadmap has been set for the economic renaissance of our state. I've already put things in motion through the dredging of the Oguta Lake to the Atlantic Ocean, which will change the economic landscape of not only Imo State, but the entire Southeast. The economic, the economic potential of this project is enormous, including an energy-free trade zone, which will leverage the abundance of hydrocarbon deposits in the area to attract investors, bat industries, and grow a robust economy. The job creation potentials of this zone is excellent indeed. During my first tenure, I embarked on rehabilitating some moribund industries and establishing new ones through a public-private partnership. Adapan Nigerian Limited, Imo Standard Shoes, the Avotopotri, and others are among the beneficiaries of this initiative. Just like the Great Opera, I also realized that having stabilized the critical infrastructure, especially roads, and knowing that our health and the education sectors were under control and running smoothly, I decided to turn my attention to the total industrialization of the state. Realizing that this could never be feasible without a regular power supply, the government of Imo State has entered into a partnership agreement taking out advantage of the latest alteration of our constitution, removing power from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legis legislative list. We have now, working with our technical and financial partners, created a platform to generate, transmit, and distribute electricity to the 27 local government areas of the state. The rehabilitation of the abandoned Eboma power plant, which has been recently transferred to Imo State government, is pivotal to the 24-hour power supply. And by the grace of God, this power project will be completed and commissioned in the first quarter of 2025. I must thank, at this juncture, most especially the president, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, for approving that the abandoned Eboma power plant be transferred to Imo State, and now for Imo State to complete and utilize. This means that our artisans, small and medium scale enterprises, and of course large industries, will have uninterrupted power supply to power their businesses. This will certainly enhance the economy of our state and by extension, the economy of Nigeria. In anticipation of a booming business environment, Imo State government has entered into an agreement for the building of a 200-bed five-star Marriott Hotel in Oweri and the full rehabilitation of the iconic Concord Hotel built by Sam Bakwe to be managed by heating group of group chains. That would align with Obara's vision of setting up presidential hotels in Portacot and the Enugu. It will boost employment. It will enhance the state's internally generated revenue and help our tourist industry to grow. Our comparative advantage as an oil producing state, which is also awash with gas deposits, will come in handy in our industrialization drive. While I have given you a snippet of my experience in governance, let me inform you that when I started this quest for the position of governor, I made a vow to God to govern with his fear through accountability and honesty. I will never know how Dr. Michael Obara came about that, that he was able to emerge untainted in his political career. But I believe that remaining true to my vow will certainly help me so far. Because, as I speak, nobody can come out openly to accuse me of corruption. My close aides, and I challenge anybody, 
I challenge anybody. My close aides who engaged in untoward activities never knew how fast they were thrown out of government. I'm still living like in houses. As a governor, as the governor of Imo State, I'm still living in houses I built before I became the governor. A few weeks ago, when I addressed Imo legislators on the occasion of their first anniversary, I again emphasized the need for us to render selfless service to the people of the state and not to be driven by the acquisition of wealth. Since I'm a human being, susceptible to making mistakes, I set up what I call the Emo Stakeholders Forum and the Elders Council to interface with me regularly. I meet with the members who comprise of former governors, deputy governors, judges, first class traditional rulers, student leaders, and market leaders. We meet periodically to render account of stewardship to them. This is a form of accountability, one of the principles of public service. These interactions give the members of the two bodies a chance to freely criticize and advise me on the policy direction of my administration. Above all, they act as a feedback mechanism between my government and the people to render gossip and fifth columnist jobless. Let me now try to conclude. At the beginning of this lecture, I sounded a warning that there won't be any comparison between what the great opera did in eastern Nigeria and my modest efforts in Imo State. If for any reason you have noticed some similarities between his policies and For a tasty meal, choose gold. In my view, Omara remains a hero in Nigeria who has not been properly sung. Perhaps I should add that if only our political leaders of today could emulate the leadership virtues of Dr. Michael Opera, our country would be better and more prosperous. Our challenge as his brothers, as his sisters, is never to relent in celebrating him. For indeed, our best. What is indisputable, what is indisputable is that the legacies of MI power will continue to inspire not just our generation, but generations to come. This is why I once again commend the organizers of this lecture series for their efforts in keeping those legacies alive. In my view, Omar remains a hero in Nigeria who has not been properly sung. Perhaps I should add that if only our political leaders of today could emulate the leadership virtues of Dr. Michael Opera, our country would be better and more prosperous. Our challenge as his brothers, as his sisters, is never to relent in celebrating him. For indeed, he was a worthy son and noble son of Nigeria and the Igbo nation. May his great soul continue to rest in peace. And may his legacies live on, as we do our best to promote and recognize his legacy. Thank you all, and may God bless all of us. Thank you. Well, that was the live lecture taking place in the nation's capital, Abuja, where the Imo state governor, Hope Uzodima, delivered the Michael Okpara leadership lecture.
governors from the southeast and south-south geopolitical zones, as well as notable figures from various sectors convened for this edition of the lecture. This event is in honor of the late Dr. Michael Opara, who was the premier of the eastern region from 1959 to 1966, known for his visionary leadership and contributions to agriculture and industrial growth.